How often do we think about where we hunt? Hi, I'm Shane Mahoney. Certainly as sportsmen, we spend a considerable amount of time in preparation. But then once in the field, our focus becomes much different. The game is afoot and we immerse ourselves in the chase and the experience, hoping to be successful at both. But before we get there, what thought do we give to location? The old saying, location, 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 certainly applies to hunting, just as much as it does in retail or in choosing where to live. Naturally, we research, scout, or obtain permission to hunt a particular area, all to put the odds in our favor that we will encounter the game we seek. But this is not the thought process about where we hunt that I am referring to. In this week's episode of Boone and Crockett Country, we will give some thought to this issue of where we hunt, and more importantly, how we came to have such an abundance of places we can freely hunt. We are blessed in North America to have at our disposal millions of acres of national forest, BLM, crown and wilderness lands on which to hunt. How this happened is worth knowing because these special places did not happen by chance. And yet without them, where would we be as hunters? We will also follow a troop of Boy Scouts as they too experience one of these places we do hunt, a designated wilderness in Montana. Special places, including our wilderness lands, are of significance to not only sportsmen, but to all citizens. We'll explore where we hunt next on Boone and Crockett Country. Crockett Country, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. At the time of European settlement of this continent, every acre of North America was very much a wilderness, wild, unforgiving, and sparsely inhabited by man. By definition, a wilderness is a natural environment on Earth that has not been significantly modified by human activity. This is the modern day definition. At the time of European settlement, wilderness meant land to explore, conquer, and exploit. This was very much the attitude of settlers, and then of a fledgling new government. The most common term used that describes this viewpoint and our actions is manifest destiny, or the belief that the expansion of civilization west to the setting sun was justified by any means. It took 300 years from the time of Columbus's landing for pioneers to cross the continent to reach and settled California. In the process we took, we altered the landscape that was in our path and we fueled this conquest with the abundant wildlife at the time. When we began to realize what we had done, some people stepped forward and took action. That someone, as we know, was hunters and anglers. We often associate the early actions of sportsmen as only being aimed at stopping the unregulated slaughter of wildlife and then attempting to recover this wildlife from the short-sightedness of the past. These are true statements, but sportsmen did more than just help the game they care about so they could continue to hunt and fish for them. With Theodore Roosevelt's formation of the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887, big game hunters began working for wildlife on a national scale. The club's concern was very much about depleted big game populations. Its study of the problems and how to fix them, however, quickly led to an all-out effort to protect land. Habitat became the focal point of the Boone and Crockett Club's agenda. With land being a top priority to wildlife recovery, Club members drafted the Timberland Reserve Bill of 1891, which made it possible for the president to claim land under federal authority for all the people. Club members persuaded then President Harrison to begin setting aside forest reserves, the first of which was the Yellowstone Reserve in Montana and Wyoming, followed by an additional 13 million acres across the United States, the National Park and National Forest Systems were born. We mentioned earlier, someone stepped forward for habitat. And now we know that someone was sportsman. 
Unfortunately, the millions of international visitors and Americans who will visit a national park or venture through a national forest or wilderness area this year will have no idea who had the foresight and commitment to remove these lands from development and keep them in wild perpetuity for all the people and our wildlife. We need to ask ourselves why there is not a sign or a plaque to be found anywhere within these sanctuaries acknowledging sportsmen for their efforts. Why is our history unknown? Now that national forests were set aside, they needed to be managed for both use and sustainability. The next piece of legislation proposed by sportsmen provided the management system for the newly formed forest reserves. After Harrison, President Cleveland claimed another 20 million acres of forest. In the meantime, club members proposed the Flathead Forest Reserve in Montana, which would become Glacier National Park. When Theodore Roosevelt took the office of president in 1901, and before he left this post in 1909, he provided federal protection for almost 230 million acres. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Wild Sheep Foundation, putting and keeping sheep on the mountain, and the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. The Boy Scouts of America have a long-standing tradition of introducing young men to the outdoors. As part of this mission, troops from around the country have the opportunity to work toward and then participate in destination experiences. Since 2006, the Boone and Crockett Club has offered its Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Ranch, located along the Rocky Mountain Front in west central Montana, as a Montana High Adventure Base Camp for Scouts. The attraction to this specific location is the adjacent Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex. We get the comment a lot that, you know, this, this isn't a Boy Scout camp, this is too nice for a Boy Scout camp. Pretty modern facilities. Rasmussen Wildlife Conservation Center was completed in 2001. So they have excellent facilities to establish a base camp out of. And then just the, the backdrop kind of came natural to the club to be able to access the Forest Service lands and the wilderness just right in our back door. Definitely a huge benefit to our conservation education program. The Bob, as locals affectionately call it, is the nation's fifth largest wilderness area comprised of just over one million acres and ranges in elevation from 4,000 to 9,000 feet. The adjacent scapegoat and great bear wildernesses make up the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex, bringing the total wilderness acreage to 1,535,352. Five ranger districts manage 1,856 miles of trails it is named after Bob Marshall, an early forester and conservationist. Marshall, along with Boone and Crockett Club member Aldo Leopold, were instrumental in founding the Wilderness Society in 1935, an organization dedicated to protecting America's wilderness and fostering an American land ethic. Without a doubt, our national forest system has a special significance to sportsmen. Simply put, with over 60% of land in the United States privately owned, public lands are of utmost importance to outdoor recreationists. The next major action in securing wildlife and recreational lands happened in 1964 with the passage of the Wilderness Act, a federal law that reads, in order to assure that an increasing population accompanied by expanding settlement and growing mechanization, does not occupy and modify all areas within the United States and its possessions, leaving no lands designated for preservation and protection in the natural condition. It is hereby declared to be the policy of the Congress to secure for the American people of present and future generations the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. This law was very much intended to provide a supplement to the purpose for which national forests, national parks, and national wildlife refuge systems were established and administered. But a wilderness, as defined by the Act, would be very different. 
Unlike national forests, there will be no commercial activity, no temporary or permanent roads, no use of motor vehicles, motorized equipment of any kind. The only public access allowable would be on foot or horse or mule. The Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Ranch, named after our 26th president and founder of Boone Crockett, is the club's location for its place-based conservation and outdoors education programs, as well as a working beef cattle operation. Its purpose is outdoor education, especially for young people. These are the orienting lines? Yeah, the education center, it processes a lot of kids through here, which really intrigues me and, and thrills me. I like to see any time the youth are out here wandering around the hills learning about plants and animals. What you want to do... Hunting and fishing and all that, it's a thrill as opposed to sitting in a living room playing a video game or watching TV, you know. I think the more we can educate the youth of the day, the, you know, the more successful we're going to be in conservation in the future. And now, a closer look with Doug Painter, presented by Lupo, America's Optics Authority. Although Theodore Roosevelt was no longer President of the United States, when the Boy Scouts were founded in 1910, he was still a very active member of the Boone and Crockett Club and the Boy Scouts. Roosevelt prided himself on living the hearty life of the outdoors, hiking, exploring, riding, shooting, and hunting to keep physically fit, mentally awake, and morally straight. He was very much a believer in self-reliance, duty to one's country, good citizenship, and a square deal, all of which can be found in the oath, code, and motto of the Boy Scouts. Roosevelt was a troop committee man of Troop 39 of Oyster Bay, New York, near his home at Sagamore Hill, and the first commissioner of the Nassau County Council. As a former president, Roosevelt was elected honorary vice president of the Boy Scouts and the only man designated as a chief scout citizen. Roosevelt once said, more and more, I have come to believe in the Boy Scout movement. I regard it as one of the movements most full of promise for the future here in America. The Boy Scout movement is distinctly an asset to our country for the development of efficiency, virility, and good citizenship. It is essential that its leaders be men of strong, wholesome character, of unmistakable devotion to our country, its customs and ideals, as well as in soul and by law citizens thereof, whose wholehearted loyalty is given to this nation and to this nation alone. For years after his death in 1919, Many scouts and scout leaders in the New York area made annual pilgrimages to his grave in Oyster Bay. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Pope and Young Club for the Good of Bow Hunting and the Guide Outfitter Association of British Columbia. Wildlife stewardship is our priority. Today our wilderness system comprises over 107 million acres of federal lands. Administered for the people by the National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Bureau of Land Management. For the people is an important distinction because these are public lands, and lands under strict guidelines for their purpose and use. Outside of activities such as mining, grazing, and water uses that were grandfathered in when lands were given a wilderness designation, all commercial uses were eliminated. The exception is recreational use. Guided and unguided hunting, fishing, ecotouring are permitted under wilderness rules. The Wilderness Act is not without controversy. When bikes were outlawed in 1986, mountain bikers took exception to the new interpretation of the law. Over time, there has been debate over other such things deemed as vague in the law and therefore subject to interpretation. To sportsmen, wilderness has meant wilderness from the beginning, and the rules were clear. All on foot or horseback, no roads, no generators, no chainsaws. On foot is exactly how these Boy Scouts experienced the Bob Marshall. 
I just thought it was beautiful. It was it was great. I loved it. I loved being outside. It was great. My favorite view was when we climbed up to the Strawberry Mountain. I could see just the whole area, all the rivers, and it was very beautiful. I loved it. As the Wilderness Act approaches its 50th anniversary in 2014, policy influencers have been jockeying for position to have their vision of wilderness made law. For what should be a celebration has been loaded down with debate. Most recently, objections are being raised once again, pointed at hunting and fishing rights and access. House Resolution 4089, titled the Sportsman's Heritage Act, proposed in February 2012, was designed to reaffirm who, what, when, where, and how. Its purpose is to protect and enhance opportunities for recreational hunting, fishing and shooting by requiring federal public land management officials to facilitate the use of and access to federal public lands, including wilderness areas. Opponents to the bill claim this is all about allowing sportsmen to drive their vehicles into wilderness areas and question the right to hunting and fishing in wilderness in general. The problem is this. When federal lands in the U.S. were set aside by Congress over 100 years ago, it was automatically assumed that hunting and fishing activities would take place on these lands. There was no perceived need to write this into the laws at that time. Today, anti-hunting advocates are using this omission in the law to insist that public land managers take special action to now justify hunting and fishing on federal lands, including wilderness areas. Basically, they are now challenging the public right to hunt and fish in these places, despite the fact that it was often hunters and their organizations who lobbied to establish these areas in the first place, not only for themselves, but for all the people. This is wrong. The truth is, Nothing in the Sportsman's Heritage Act's language opens wilderness areas to motorized vehicles or road building. The word access here means just that. Sportsmen should have access. Boone and Crockett Country has been brought to you by Lupo, America's Optics Authority, and the Boone and Crockett Club, fair chase and conservation since 1887. Conservation of wild places and wild things should be something everyone can agree on. History shows when and where hunting and fishing happen. Conservation happens. For conservation to happen, therefore, sportsmen need access to places to hunt and fish. The time is long overdue for those who oppose hunting and fishing to know the history of how we came to have these wild places in the first place including wilderness areas. If non-use preservation were the answer over wise use conservation, why is it that this model is failing miserably in other countries? Failing to the point where wildlife has become scarce and what wildlife does exist is often poorly managed and constantly under threat to poaching, habitat loss, and booming and crashing populations. Wilderness. Not only has the establishment of wilderness areas been another in a long list of conservation successes on this continent, but wilderness areas represent a common ground between hunters and non-hunters. Unspoiled places were preserved for all the people and have a profound effect on anyone who experiences what truly wild landscapes look and feel like. The experience is often described as spiritual or even religious and is always awe-inspiring. It is certainly true that hunters and anglers historically have taken advantage of the existence of our wilderness areas, perhaps more than any other group. But this dynamic is changing. More people are reconnecting with the outdoors than ever before, and certainly experiencing a wilderness area firsthand is a great place to start. In a rapidly changing and developing world, we need broad public support to keep these areas wild and secure. 
We as sportsmen should be encouraged by this increased interest in the outdoors and take pride in sharing what we have known and enjoyed for a century. After all, common ground must be found between non-hunters and ourselves and as wide a public as possible. Why? Because our passion and commitment to wild places and wild things, a matter of historical record, may not be sufficient to preserve them into the future. As human populations continue to grow and place increasing demands on our natural resources, our passion alone will simply not hold back the tide. We will need others, committed as we are and thinking as we do, to ensure outdoor traditions receive the attention they deserve. Others who understand that hunting and angling have a rightful place and purpose, even if they do not participate in these activities themselves. In time, we hope to do just that. Thank you for watching. I'm Shane Mahoney.